Hi, my name is Denise Rodriguez. I'm a librarian at Mount St. Vincent University, and I'd like to tell you about our lesbian pulp fiction collection. It's on display on the main floor of the library. We started collecting in the mid-1990s at the request of the Women's Studies Department and the English Department. We've continued collecting over the years, and it now stands at about 130 titles. A few key points to remember about Pulp Fiction paperbacks. They were inexpensively produced. They were printed on pulp paper, very much the same quality as those earlier magazines. They had very wide distribution, again, very much on the model of magazines and newspapers. Their content and their cover art was very provocative, meant for to catch the eye and for quick sale. And this was across all the genres, not just lesbian pulp. And they were very popular and very profitable. Spring Fire, which came out in 1952, sold more than 1.5 million copies in its first printing. And it was reprinted several times. This level of buzz for paperback seems very odd for us today, and you have to think back to what life was like in the 1950s. It was an era of repression for many. Homosexuality was against the law and grounds for employment dismissal, and many men and some women lost their jobs, particularly in the civil services in the US and Canada. Homosexuality was classified as a mental illness, it was against the law to wear clothing that was not designed for your assigned gender, and some people were arrested and put in jail for this. Libraries classified LGBT plus books under headings such as sexual perversion, and they were often kept separated from the rest of the uh, collection. Other media, like radio, television, and movies, self-censored depictions of lifestyles that did not reflect the white, nuclear, family-centered mainstream. So it was difficult to find information on sort of gay lifestyles, on divorce, on raising children out of marriage. And of course, there was a real hunger for this kind of information. So this brings us to our lesbian pulp fiction collection. The books in the collection were all published in a paperback format between the 1950s and the mid 60s. The books have clearly identified lesbian characters or subject matter. It's not just a subtext or an illusion. And the books all consist of sensationalized cover art that allows readers to recognize them as lesbian pop fiction. You may be wondering why we have the mid-1960s as the end of lesbian pop fiction. I mean, after all, lesbian paperbacks in a variety of genres are still with us to this very day. The, the reason that we have it ending around 1967 is that uh, the intention of these lesbian pulp fiction uh, novels was to be sold for a male audience and although it was the first time really that you had such widespread representation of lesbians on you know in paperbacks and on books that were widely distributed it wasn't intended for lesbians it was intended for men and for that reason we distinguish it from the books that came out later in the late 60s 70s and up until today you can see from these examples from our collection how clear it is from the cover art that these are books with lesbian content and you have to remember that for many lesbians in the 1950s, that this would be the only place, the only medium within which they would see representations of their lives. It was very much a double-edged sword because in these covers were also embedded a lot of the stereotypes about lesbians that still, some of them persist to today. There was a fairly strict formula demanded of the writers. 
The stories, for the most part, were set in very female settings, like dorms and barracks. Many ended tragically. It was the Berry Yogi troupe that we still have with us today, but it was imposed by the publishers on the writers. The relationships were not often positive, often portrayed intense, dominant, submissive dynamics and very sort of emotional, dramatic relationships. The whole tone of the books were voyeuristic in nature, very much a male gaze or a heteronormative gaze. So here are the type of books you can expect to find in our collection. We have a couple of the early 20th century reprints. So these are books that would have been published early in the century, but then were repackaged during this uh, pulp fiction craze of the 50s. The stories aren't representative of that formula I just uh, told you about, because they were published, written and published before that formula. They still are very reflective of their time, so that the characters are often very uh, closeted and uh, are still dealing with much uh, prejudice and discrimination. But they do reflect uh, a time before the uh, the mid-century. They're part of lesbian pulp fiction because, of course, they got caught up in the repackaging of books for the the paperbacks, and that's why they're included. We also have a couple of titles that were written in the mid-20th century and published in hardcover first before being put out as uh, paperbacks. The most well-known one is The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, writing under the pen name Claire Morgan. She was already an established uh, novelist before she wrote this. The other titles shown on the screen were all from Europe, either Great Britain or France. So they were published there in hardcover before being picked up by the American paperback publishers for distribution in the States as paperbacks. These also tended to differ from that strict formula I spoke about, but are reflective of their time. The majority of our collection consists of the paperback originals, many of which have that eroticized portrayals of queer women written for the the male audience. Many of the writers were also men. For example, A Strange Delights was actually penned by Robert Silverberg, who is now better known as a science fiction writer. The Young and Innocent was written by Donald Westlink, who is a very well-known mystery and crime writer. In fact, he is now a Mystery Writers of America Grand Master and won the 1991 Best Motion Picture Screenplay for The Grifters. Now, there were a few lesbians also writing these at the time. For example, The Evil Friendship was written by Vin Packer, a pen name for Mary Jean Mika. She was a very prolific pulp fiction writer and was more than happy to sell books for whatever formula was being asked. A smaller but important part of our collection are the paperback originals with positive portrayals of queer women. Now, when I say positive, what I mean is that the protagonists had a clear sense of themselves as lesbians, and at the end of the story, at least one of the protagonists continues to have an identity as a lesbian. And they have survived and lived to love again. These stories, for the most part, were written by women who were lesbian or bisexual during that time period. You'll note uh, Spring Fire by Vin Packer. In this book, Mary Jane Amika wrote a much more positive portrayal of lesbians than in The Evil Friendship. Though, you know, right in tune with the formula, it does have a sad ending. These books are of particular interest to researchers because they do provide some insight into what 
life may have been like during that time for lesbians. Heavily fictionalized and very dramatic, but still provides us with some sense of what was going on at a time when all other portrayals of queer women were not to be found in any media. We also have a couple of titles that come under the category of non-fiction and put that in inverted commas and a huge question mark because they were written by many of the same fiction writers that we've talked about already. They were simply the eroticized tales packaged either as journalistic treatments or scientific case studies but they they really are just pure fiction. Some names to pay attention to would be Anne Aldrich, which was another pen name for Mary Jane Meeker, and the writer of uh, Twilight Woman was another pen name for science fiction writer Robert Silverberg. Finally, we have a couple of titles that are not strictly lesbian pulp fiction, but they have interest because they demonstrate what's going on in the late 1960s at the end of lesbian pulp fiction. This is the time of the women's movement, of gay liberation, and of the changes in how the obscenity laws were being interpreted by the courts. So you have everything becoming much more open, there's a, a real sense of change. And this is reflected in the paperbacks by on the one side, on the left side of the screen, you see Patience and Sarah and Shockproof Sydney Skate, which are much more feminist in their approach to storytelling. And that all formula is being abandoned by the publishers. And finally, we see that Mary Jean Mika is able to write a pro-lesbian story under her own name. On the right of the screen, we have I Spanking Lesbian and Frustration, which shows that that male market is going much more in the line of sleaze publishing. So you really see a, a polarization and a split in what was formerly lesbian pulp fiction. And by the, the late 1960s, lesbian pulp fiction is, is really over. I've been telling you the real names of some of these authors as I've been talking about the collection, but it's important to remember that almost everyone wrote using a pen name as it was illegal to write about lesbian lifestyles. It would have been charged with obscenity. Unfortunately, most of the authors are now completely unknown and their names have been lost to history. While many of these stories are straight morality tales with compulsory heterosexuality and punishment for living a queer life, they still give us insight into that era and insight into how lesbian lives were being portrayed and what the implications were for marginalized people during that time period. We also know through interviews with uh, women who lived through that time period that many of these books also acted like queer conduct books or how-to books. They provided fashion tips and dating tips and hints of how to pass in a hostile world. And here's an example in the book Unlike Others by Valerie Taylor. You carried a book like We Walk Alone or The Lonely Path to the Lunchroom and waited for the other person to make an opening. That didn't always work because recently there was a tremendous interest in gay books on the part of straight people. But sometimes you picked up a friend that way. So you can see how a book like this would have been of great interest to lesbians at that time, especially if they were very closeted and very isolated from other lesbians. These books gave tips of how they might be able to connect with other people in their widespread and dispersed community. In pulp fiction also caught the attention of the early gay and lesbian press. Although their 
practically no reviews of lesbian pulp fiction in other any other venue they do appear in the newsletter the lesbian newsletter the ladder Barbara Greer, who later became a publisher of lesbian paperbacks, at that time was a reviewer. And she often reviewed lesbian pop fiction as a way of alerting the good ones and warning her readers away from the really trashy ones. Her reviews actually give some insight. For example, here it says... At the publisher's insistence, some of this novel has pointless additives, but the practice reader will have no difficulty in separating the good from the bad. And this gives us some insight to how women were reading these books. Although they were pretty toxic with really horrible scenes and ending sadly, because there was nothing else, because there was no other representation, Lesbians would read these books and just extract whatever goodness there was, whatever sense of connection there was, just because they were hungry for that kind of content. Fortunately, Lesbian Pulp Fiction did catch the attention of law enforcement. There was a case in Ottawa where a new seller was charged with obscenity for selling copies of the woman's barracks. The judge in that case said that it was his opinion that the book could have no other effect than to deprave and corrupt. Sanity trials weren't all that common because, of course, law officials didn't want to give the pulp fiction books any more publicity than they already had. What was more common was for governmental committees to take complaints from lobby groups and then do negotiations and deals with the distributors to allow the majority of Pulp Fiction books onto the newsstands, but to have the ones that were most complained about or the most controversial removed before they ever got to the newsstands. These complaints were most likely to come from lobby groups, like, for example, the National Organization for Decent Literature, which was a faith-based group that advocated for restriction on all paperbacks in the 1950s. They would form committees to read the books. If the majority of the committee found it objectionable, it would be added to a list that was distributed across the US and Canada. Smaller groups would then visit newsstands and uh, supermarkets, small bookstores, and look for the titles that were on their list. They would then inform the owner that unless the books were removed, perhaps the neighborhood might not buy there anymore. So in essence, it was a type of boycott action. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the Mount St. Vincent University Lesbian Pulp Fiction Collection. I hope I've been able to share why we think it's important to preserve these books so that they are accessible to students and to scholars. You can see that they're important for their cover art, for their representation of lesbian lives at a time when no other representation was available. As an example of the type of literature that was heavily censored. The library has, you know, archives and special collections to have these books so that everyone can still get access to them. We usually have it open to the public. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 restrictions, it's now only open to students and faculty at Mount St. Vincent University. But let's hope that uh, things open up soon and that we can once again uh, welcome everyone to come see this very unusual and interesting collection.